So OpenAI has unveiled it. GPT 4.5 is out in the wild. They say it is their, quote, largest and best model for chat yet. They say of the model, quote, early testing shows that interacting with GPT 4.5 feels more natural. It's broader knowledge base, improved ability to follow user intent, and greater EQ make it useful for tasks like improving writing, programming, and solving practical problems. We also expect it to hallucinate less. That sentiment was echoed by Sam Altman, who also posted, good news, it is the first model that feels like talking to a thoughtful person to me. I've had several moments where I've sat back in my chair and been astonished at getting actually good advice from an AI. The model demonstrates impressive factual accuracy compared to predecessors. In internal testing on what OpenAI calls simple QA, which is a benchmark measuring factual knowledge, 4.5 achieved a 62.5% accuracy rate, which is significantly outperforming GPT 4.0's 38.2%. Similarly, it reduced hallucination rates from 61.8% to 37.1%. Human testers apparently also, according to OpenAI, showed a clear preference for 4.5 over 4.0, particularly for creative tasks and everyday conversations. The model's responses are notably more succinct and conversational. It has a more intuitive understanding of when to provide brief, empathetic answers versus detailed information. Now, Altman and OpenAI also note that there are some obvious flaws and limitations with 4.5 at the moment. Altman says it is, quote, a giant expensive model, and it is only available at the moment to GPT ChatGPT Pro users, the ones who pay $200 a month for that license, says Altman, quote, we really wanted to launch it to Plus and Pro at the same time, but we've been growing a lot and are out of GPUs. We will add tens of thousands of GPUs next week and roll it out to the Plus tier then. Hundreds of thousands coming soon, and I'm pretty sure y'all will use every one we can rack up. He also makes it very clear this is not a reasoning model. It will not, quote, crush benchmarks. He says, quote, it's a different kind of intelligence, and there's a magic to it I haven't felt before. So, Paul, this seems almost like they kind of optimized a frontier model almost like for vibes, which is weird to say, but seems like what they were going for here. What are your initial thoughts so far on 4.5? Do any of these pros and cons of the model particularly jump out to you? I think it's more a sign of what's coming versus being some obvious leap forward in capabilities and performance. Um, I, I've personally been using it. I was using it this morning uh, as I was kind of getting ready for the podcast and I was experimenting with some prompts. I think you, you need to have like an arsenal of specific uh, applications or prompts that you test these things on. Like Ethan Mollock, you know, does a great job with this. Yeah. He's got these like same prompts he uses every time. And it's like, Okay, yes, I can see and feel the difference. I don't think the average user will feel the difference or, or you know, if you just start using it, start to see like these outputs where you're just like, oh my gosh, this is such a massive leap over four. And I, I don't think that's the point. Um, so a couple of notes, it, they say it does have access to updated information, including search. It supports mm -hmm. files and image uploads. It can use Canvas uh, for writing and coding but it does not support multimodal features like voice. So you can't go into advanced voice. Even if you have the pro account, you're not going to get to talk to 4.5 yet. Um, video and screen sharing, those aren't in there yet. That'll you know kind of come later on. Um, there's a few things of, I think very noteworthy. Like as I sp started spending more time thinking about this this morning in preparation, um, a couple of things jumped out at me. So first, this uh, ongoing debate about scaling laws. And you know, the, there's the two methods now. There's throw more NVIDIA chips, more, you know, more compute and more data at these things and, um, you know, let them learn and get smarter. And then there's the reasoning, like the test time compute where you give them more time to think. So this is the latter or the prior. This is the unsupervised learning, you know, giving it more compute, giving it more data, um, 10 times probably more than GPT-4 is the belief and, uh, and see what happens, see what kind of comes out the other side. And so what they claim is by doing this, by giving it roughly 10x more pre-training compute, 
um, these things start to recognize patterns better. They draw connections. They generate more creative insights without reasoning. And then GPT-5 is where we'll get this merger of the models and it'll now have the reasoning abilities as well. So the reason you may not experience some dramatic feeling uh, in terms of the difference of the output is because it's sort of all just this underlying broader knowledge, deeper understanding of the world. I thought Andres Karpathy, who we've talked about many, many times on this show, but he was uh, at OpenAI for a couple of stints. He had a great tweet that sort of like gave his personal perspective. And I thought I'd read that real quick or excerpts of it. It was a pretty long tweet because I think it sort of sets the stage here. So he said, I've been looking forward to this for two years, ever since GPT-4 was released, because this release offers a qualitative measurement of the slope of improvement you get out of scaling pre-training com compute, which means simply training a bigger model. So he's the one that's saying each 0.5 in a version is roughly 10x pre-training compute. So that's just more NVIDIA chips being applied to this stuff, basically. So he said, for context, recall GPT-1 barely generates coherent text. GPT-2 was a confused toy in his words. Hmm. They skipped 2.5, went right to 3, which was interesting. And Mike, if I'm not mistaken, GPT-3 was what was in the world when you and I wrote the Marketing Artificial Intelligence book. Yes. So there was, a, there was a section I wrote where I, I said, what happens when machines can write like humans? That section was written in... I think I wrote that in early 2022 and it would have been projecting out like what we were seeing, seeing already happening. And we knew we were going to enter this phase where these things could write like humans. So this is before the chat GPT moment, but we were already seeing this enough that we wrote about it in our book is like sort of an inevitable outcome. Um, so then Andres continues, uh, GPT 3.5 crossed the threshold where it was enough to actually ship as a product and sparked OpenAI's chat GPT moment. Uh, GPT-4 in turn also felt better, but I'll say it definitely felt subtle. I remember being part of a hackathon trying to find concrete prompts where GPT-4 outperformed 3.5. So again, like this is someone who is sitting in these labs having this same debate back from 3.5, which was the first version of chat GPT in November 22 to GPT-4, which came out in March 23. Um, and so they were having the same battle internally. Like we're trying to find the subtleties, trying to find, mm. it's just smarter. It just feels different. It feels better, but it's hard to like explain. So then he goes on to say, we do actually expect to see an improvement in tasks that are not reasoning, or this is actually going back to, um, yeah, yeah, this is still Andres. Um, improvement in tasks that are not reasoning heavy. And I would say those are tasks that are more EQ as opposed to IQ related and um bottlenecked by for example world knowledge creativity a knowledge an an analogy making there we go uh general understanding humor etc so these are tasks that i was most interested in doing during my vibe check so for me i started focusing in on this eq versus iq concept because i think this is very very fundamental to understand where these things go and that's why i'm saying i see 4.5 more as a prelude and, and, and honestly like i think it gives us a few months <laughs> um not much more than that because five is coming mm. to grapple with what what it means when these models become high in eq so um uh, some context here so in the gpt5 post from OpenAI. They highlight right toward the beginning, combining deep understanding of the world with improved collabor collaboration results in a model that integrates ideas naturally in warm and intuitive conversations that are more attuned to human collaboration. GPT 4.5 has a better understanding of what humans mean and interprets subtle clues or implicit expectations with greater nuance and EQ, emotional quotient, right? That's what EQ stands for, emotional quotient. Yeah, it's like, a, it's like emotional intelligence, I guess. Yeah. And yeah, it'd be emotional intelligence quotient, quotient like or whatever. Quotient. Yeah, okay. yeah. All right, so GPT-5 also shows stronger aesthetic intuition and creativity. It excels at helping with writing and design. So to me, the EQ part is what really matters here because it moves models more into the realm of skills, traits, and even professions that we perceive to still be uniquely human or like safe. So IQ provides the foundation for solving intellectual, technical, analytical challenges. EQ is all about navigating social complexities, communicating clearly, handle, handling emotional nuances. So 
when we think about what is the impact of e as these models, whether it's Claude or Gemini, or in this case, GPT 4.5, as they become higher in emotional intelligence, it enables interactions that start to feel way more natural. It gives the AI a feeling of empathy that it, it can it can seem more empathetic and it can seem more human-like. It then becomes better at task performance because it helps it discern like the subtleties of intentions behind the user's request because it actually sort of understands humans a little bit better. This leads to better supporting complex tasks like writing and uh, customer service and things like that. It does then reduce misunderstandings and errors like hallucinations just naturally fall because it starts to understand the intent behind prompts more. Mm -hmm. So I think that as we start to get this emotional intelligence, um, it, it starts to change the way we interact with these models. It starts to change the, the use cases in a business environment for the models. And it starts to probably creep more into these professions that we thought were maybe safer from AI. And so that kind of led me to think about, well, what are the ramifications of this? Like as the emotional intelligence increases, what do we now have to face both in business and society? And so a couple of things that came to mind, um, one is manipulation risks. So AI could be subtly manipulating the user by appealing directly to their emotions that um, enables them to start affecting decisions and behaviors, privacy and data. So these AI systems have to analyze and understand deep emotional cues, um, often requiring access to sensitive data. So this is where you know, Sam has alluded to this, that the future of their models, and certainly we've heard this with other model companies, is memory and personalization are the keys. It wants to remember every interaction. It wants to personalize the experience to you. So EQ is a path to true personalization. And if you have something that can talk in a very natural way to you and be empathetic to you and truly understand your emotions and your needs, or at least per perceive that it is, now you get de dealing with these emotional bonds and dependencies that people develop with their AI, which we're already starting to see with models that don't have high emotional intelligence. And this leads to maybe the biggest concern of all, which is earlier last year on the podcast, I shared a tweet from Sam where he said he thought these machines would be superhuman at persuasion before they were super, superhuman at anything else. And so in the AI exposure key that we talked about um, when I was sharing the jobs GPT-2 stuff and that I created last year, one of the key exposures is level eight, which is persuasion abilities. And as I've said before, these models already are superhuman at persuasion. It's just red teamed out of them. Like mm -hmm. persuasion is the ability to convince people to change their beliefs, attitudes, intentions, motivations, behaviors. And it uses advanced reasoning. It uses emotional appeals. It uses the ability to understand and influence people's um, you know, emotional intelligence. And so I think persuasion starts to become like a truly concerning area of development. So again, just to recap, like, are you going to go into 4.5 if you're paying the 200 bucks a month and like feel the difference? I don't know. May maybe for some prompts or use cases, you might. But I think the underlying thing here is OpenAI is putting this into the world three months roughly before they launch GPT-5, which will not only have higher emotional intelligence, because go back to Karpathy's tweet, 10x. So if my math is doing this right, from GPT-4 to GPT-5 is 100x increase in compute, go 10x to 10x. So you're going to not only have a much more powerful model, you're going to have reasoning layered over that model. And you're probably going to see a massive leap in the emotional intelligence once you layer reasoning over an already more powerful model. So I think it's probably just very important that people don't gloss over this release as like, eh, it's the same. I don't really see the difference. That's not the point. I think the point is to prepare us for GPT-5, which will likely be a leap of sorts over what you're used to, and it will have the reasoning capabilities baked into it. And I'm very, very confident in saying that, like, no one is really prepared for that. Like in business, um, again, Mike, you and I sit in these meetings all the time. We run workshops. We do talk. You just show people like the most fundamental things like image yeah. generation. And they're just like jaws on the floor, blown away. This is possible. 
they're not thinking about like where these things are going and what they're truly going to be capable of. 